What I wanted to do, and I actually made some notes because I think the, the angle with which I, I put my presentation together was looking at really from a kind of a ground view. I, I think the speakers so far have looked at things from a much higher uh, level. And so I'm going to share with you some of the practical aspects we deal with with antimicrobial use. But in the context of what was just said, I wanted to um, make a couple of comments I think that are different in terms of the way as human physicians we deal with uh, antibiotic use. Uh, per first off, the only um, use that we, or the only indications we use the, the antibiotics for for therapeutic reasons or for prophylaxis in terms of uh, preoperative surgical interventions. And there really has been um, a, a lot of freedom, I guess, among with, free, with physicians to use um, antimicrobials. There are indications. We always look at the FDA indications, but as was mentioned, um, there are a lot of drugs that are used off-label. And there's, you know, very little, I guess, within our um, healthcare system to to regulate that uh, other than at the, the provider level. And the other thing I think is, um, you know, the, the um, drugs are available to any physicians and have the opportunity, they can use those per, to prescribe for any uh, patients. And the antimicrobial stewardship initiatives, which I'll mention near the end of the talk, are kind of an effort to get our hands around the use a little bit better. The other thing is the um, uh, Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, which um, has a lot of regulation over what we do, is, is really pushing towards requirement for indications of drugs. And we're in the process at the medical center of developing a program where every time an antibiotic is ordered, you have to have an indication listed. That's not been the case. And sometimes, as I discuss some of the um, initiatives that we have, uh, that's been one of our problems in terms of trying sometimes to figure out you know, what was the reason this antimicrobial was prescribed. Did the patient have pneumonia? Did they have um, urinary tract infection or whatever? Um, because uh, sometimes from the notes it's not completely clear the indication. The other thing is uh, medic, uh, CMS is looking at requiring um, some kind of 72-hour prompt for um, Reminding physicians when somebody's on an antibiotic, you know, remind them, you know, how long does this, does this patient need to be on, and what's the duration, um, and so forth. And and that's one thing we've also worked on is um, there's been good studies lately that have shown that we probably don't need to treat infections as long as we used to think we need to. So the duration has shortened, and obviously that ex that reduces the antibiotic exposure. This is the kind of data that um, comes out a lot in that we see published is that there's these huge number of antibiotics prescribed annually um, and that as much as 25 to 40 percent of hospitalized patients receive antibiotics. Some of these may be unnecessary or suboptimal. And the one thing that we have tried to emphasize um, in our training of physicians is that antibiotics are societal drugs. So Unlike, say, a blood pressure medication that if you use it in patient A, it's still going to be effective in patient B and C and so forth, if we use an antibiotic on one patient, it may actually impact the, its effectiveness on another patient because of its impact on the microbial population. So I looked at this. Um, I wanted to talk with you a little bit some of the struggle we have with actually measuring and monitoring how antibiotics are used. And there's a couple of reasons why we would be interested in this. One is because we do view this as a precious resource and we want to keep tr be able to um, keep track of how the drugs are used and make sure that they're used appropriately. There's also a lot of emphasis on looking at the relationship between the use and the development of resistance. And then also, from my perspective, we want to look at the impact of our stewardship, antibiotic stewardship interventions to see if we've actually made an, an impact on uh, use. And I, I'm one of these people that believe that we can't manage what we don't measure. And there are lots of um, times when we've, we've tried to you know, I think from a national perspective, struggled in terms of figuring out um, issues around antibiotic use because nobody's actually measuring 
how they're being used or the volumes of use. So this is just this is from a paper that we published a, a year or so ago when we looked at what are the different ways that you can measure antimicrobial use and the W the last issue the last one there the defined daily doses is something that the World Health Organization has has promoted and I'll talk about that in a moment but the antimicrobial days which is a, a way of looking at antimicrobial pressure is the sum of the calendar days on we, which each antimicrobial drug was administered. So there's some examples there of how we would actually calculate these. The, this, the WHO has a very um, exhaustive program to look at defined daily doses, not only for antibiotics, but for a number of drugs. And each drug is assigned a ATC code, as indicated. And this is from their website. And also have this large manual that looks at um, how to calculate these. So the um, anatomical therapeutic chemical classification is used. So each antibiotic has a ATC code. And so the defined daily dose is considered the average daily main dose per day for its drug, for its main indication in adults. And it says right in the manual that drug consumption uh, data presented in defined daily doses only gives a rough, rough estimate of consumption. And this is one of the issues that we've had when, as I'll show you some examples here in a minute, in terms of trying to measure actual antimicrobial use using this system. And it's all based on a, the 70 kilogram uh, system. Or it's assuming that it's an adult weighing 70 kilograms, which is the, I don't know what if, you know, what the standard, what the average weight would be nowadays if we <laughs> looked at that. But. And you can also go to this website. You can put in a, a drug name, and it'll give you the ATC code, and it'll actually give you what the dose is. So I just pulled up a couple of examples. So these are some common drugs that we use. So cefepime, the defined daily dose, this is a fourth generation cephalosporin, was two grams was considered the defined daily dose. And that would be, uh, in humans, giving a gram every 12 hours. Well, the reality is we use this um, we actually give this drug by extended infusion, and we actually give two grams every eight hours. So it, it's clear that the defined daily dose is a, you know, using that would be a problem based on how much drug we actually use. Vancomycin um, is two grams, and um, that's one gram every 12 hours, which is sort of an estimated standard dose. Daptomycin, a, a new anti-MRSA drug, um, they've calculated on a 70 kilogram man that this would, or person would be four milligrams per kilo. The reality is that we usually give six to 10 milligrams per kilo. And then linazolid, another new um, MRSA drug, actually the dose they have it would be standard for what we we would use. So there was, um, there's been some efforts to look at um, just the the volume of antimicrobials being used in um, U.S. hospitals for human use. And also I'll share with you some outpatient data as well. But this was a, a study from uh, Virginia Commonwealth. And they looked at, they were able to get antimicrobial use data from 130 hospitals through this uh, database. And they could calculate the defined daily dose. And they also calculated the days of antimicrobial therapy. So one day of therapy would be if you administered any um, antimicrobial on that day, regardless of what dose and how frequently you gave it. And I'm not sure how well this project projects, but you can see there's a large number of these drugs where the, def the defined daily dose is significantly different from the days of therapy measurement. And, um, and what this, if you look at this a little, um, drill down a little bit better, when you look at um, scatter plots and compare the the de days of therapy to the defined daily dose, when the administered dose that we give is the same as the defined daily dose, then there's good correlation between the methods. But when the administered dose is lower than the recommended defined daily dose, then the defined daily dose significantly underestimates things compared to the days of therapy, and the opposite when the, the dose is greater than the recommended defined daily dose, then um, the um, defined daily dose is, ends up being significantly greater than the days of therapy. And the reason I mention this is this has been a big debate 
among um, our our group, our infectious disease physicians, in terms of how do we actually measure antimicrobial use? And I think based on studies like this and and other problems, you know, that the defined daily doses are only applicable to adults and can't be used in pediatric populations, and it's not applicable to patients that have renal failure. I think most um, of us have moved away from using, trying to use defined daily dose as a, a use measure. And then, so we tried to look at um, measurement of antibiotic use, and as was mentioned, in an area where uh, use is the highest, and that's intensive care units. And so we, this was part of a, a project that was funded by the CDC Prevention Epicenter Program. So we had five hospitals and looked at the intensive care units in those hospitals and tried to look at what are the, um, the sources that you get the data to, to measure use. So in some hospitals, we looked at actual pharmacy dispensing. Others looked at physician orders, and others looked at um, the actual administration that was um, recorded on the electronic medical administration record. And there, there were a number of difficulties with each one of these. And the problem was that um, they're not having a standardized system for measuring use in the intensive care units. We, we got spurious results when you compared one hospital to the other. So the, I think, um, and the European, um, and I think you're going to spend time in your subsequent discussions when you look at some of the national programs for measuring resistance and use. Um, but the, the European uh, system has um, uh, developed this program called the uh, Antimicrobial Resistance Surveillance System. And they've been able to um, monitor, you know, through the EU and having all the um, countries agree to following standard definitions for reporting uh, resistance pathogens. And also by looking at pharmacy data, have been able to do some studies to look at the impact of use on resistance. And so this is um, their website. And so this is an older study, but um, it used this, this system, and they were able to look at um, the reported penicillin resistance of streptococcus pneumoniae isolates compared to outpatient antimicrobial prescribing. And um, this is a theme that we've seen over and over again. So in the, in the countries where they had high antibiotic prescribing for either penicillin or macrolide drugs, they had very high, higher resistant uh, profiles among their strep pneumonia isolates compared to countries where they had lower use. And this has been um, a lot of the pressure and the argument that we've had in terms of trying to optimize and limit our, our antimicrobial use. Um, there was a similar study that was done in the, the United States that looked at um, data from the CDC's active bacterial core surveillance network that tracks pneumococcal infections in seven states. And uh, also, the antibiotic data was extracted from a proprietary pharmacy database to look at um, prescriptions. And basically showed that during the study time period from 1996 to 2003, there was a, a substantial decrease in the use of outpatient antibiotics. But the, the sites that had high prescribing had a higher number of cases of in invasive disease that were, that were resistant to antibiotics as opposed to the, the low prescribing sites. And cephalosporins and macrolides appeared to, to primarily select for penicillin and multidrug resistant strains. The CDC a few years ago developed, probably more than a dec decade ago, developed a program called the Get Smart Program. And the, really the push was to discourage the use of um, uh, antibiotics for respiratory infections in the outpatient setting. There was a huge campaign, and we, we were involved in some studies um, when I was out west uh, several years ago looking at um, the impact of working with um, family physicians in outpatient settings to um, not use antimicrobials for respiratory infections. We gave them al treatment algorithms that um, 
help to guide their therapy. And there's been this big campaign from the CDC, and as a consequence of that, we've seen this kind of uh, trends where the outpatient use of antimicrobials over the last decade and a half is significantly reduced. And, and I think parents are getting the message that if their kids have an ear infection, they don't always need an antibiotic, and so there's putting less, they're hopefully putting less pressure on their physicians to uh, prescribe antibiotics. But that's one um, campaign that's been, I think, quite successful. And along that same uh, vein, the CDC has started a new program called Get Smart for Healthcare, which is looking at trying to reduce antimic antimicrobial use in the hospital setting. And this is um, uh, just uh, look at uh, you know some causal associations between antibiotic use and the emergence of resistance. I've kind of alluded to that in areas where there's high use, there there tends to be higher resistance, but um, particularly in areas within the hospitals like the intensive care unit where there's the highest rates of resistance, um, that's where we have the highest antibiotic use. And um, so again, getting back to trying to measure in, in our study the impact of use, this is a study that looked at um, looking at the rates of fluoroquinolone resistant Pseudomonas aeruginosa in U.S. hospitals compared to when contrasted with the fluoroquinolone use. And so this is um, two database programs that had co collaborative or cooperative hospital participation to gather data on the resistance, um, number of resistant organisms over time, as well as being able to link to their um, antibiotic use, again, using that same sort of proprietary pharmacy program. And so this demonstrated that in the hospital, over this time period um, of the study, the hospital fluoroquinolone use uh, definitely increased, and so did the um, community fluoroquinolone use. And when you looked, they looked specifically at the correlation with hospitals that had high use of fluoroquinolones and the proportion of their pseudomonas isolates that were uh, fluoroquinolone resistant. You can see that we continue to see this, you know, this theme in the outpatient setting where you have high use and high resistance and in the hospital setting the same thing. And this is, I'm just using these as some examples um, of a theme that we see over and over again. And in the, my next talk, I'll, I'll emphasize some of this a little bit more. But the, so the CDC has tried to um, make an effort to look at how can we, um, one, measure how antibiotics are being used in the United States, and then how can we get our arms around that to control that. And these are human antibiotic use. So they did the three studies. The phase one pilot study was... Uh, looked at in 2009 in nine acute care hospitals and, and in conjunction with a meeting in Jacksonville, Florida. Phase two was a rollout survey of 22 acute care hospitals, and then phase three was to look um, at a much larger sampling of 180. And unfortunately, I wasn't able to get all the data. The, the phase one um, study just showed that antimicrobial therapy was the most sensitive proxy indicator for the development of a healthcare associated infection. So that really doesn't have a lot to do with use and resistance. But in phase two, they were able to show that um, antibiotic use, the prevalence was almost 50% of hospitalized patients were on antibiotics. And among the patients looked at um, that were receiving treatment for an active infection, vancomycin and piperacillin and tazobactam were the most commonly prescribed antimicrobials. And interestingly, if you, most patients that we see in the hospital who get admitted with, um, that are quite ill and look empiric, you know, they're getting empiric therapy and look like they have an infection, almost all of them get vancomycin, and piperacillin, and tazobactam as frontline sort of empiric therapy because they cover a broad range of gram positive and gram negative organisms. So the, the CDC is just now launching a program through the National Health Safety Network um, to collect antibiotic use data. And I wanted to just share that with you. Um, so this is from uh, this, they have a, a module 
that hospitals can participate in where they can report their antimicrobial use data. And so the um, objective is to facilitate risk-adjusted uh, use so they, they can compare inter- and intra-facility benchmarking of use and also look at the trends in use over time. So the numerator, as I kind of alluded to earlier, we've moved away from the defined daily dose approach, and so the numerator is to use antimicrobial days of therapy. And the denominator data is to adjust based on the um, days present. The, so this uh, a census data, um, usually a 1,000, um, the use is uh, normalized to 1,000 patient days or days present. So let me, um, I kind of gave you that backdrop because I think the struggle we have, even within our own medical center, is, is trying to look at what's the best representation of how our antimicrobials are being used. And there's studies that have looked at dispensing the pharmaceuticals and found that maybe 20% of drugs that are dispensed to be used actually never get used and they make their way back to the pharmacy. If you look at charge data or ordering data, you have the same problem in terms of um, does that really represent what actually made it to the patient. And so um, that's one thing that um, I wanted to share one of our challenges uh, in, in terms of uh, getting um, control of our antimicrobial use in the hospital. So the, the really the on-the-ground program that we've, we've used, that this is really um, becoming more and more um, important and I think is, um, will probably become legislated, just much like um, infection control programs in the hospital to control the development of healthcare associated infections that Dr. Schlesinger alluded to, what a big problem that is in terms of uh, impact on patients and the economy. That's now mandated by a joint commission and the Medicare um, regulators that the hospitals have to have an infection control program. And it looks like the movement is now going towards hospitals are going to need to have antimicrobial stewardship programs. And these programs are designed to not only limit the inappropriate use of antibiotics, but to optimize um, selection, the dosing, duration, and so forth, some of the things that I've alluded to. So, um, And the Infectious Disease Society of America and the Society for Healthcare Epidemiology of America, which are two of our infectious disease um, professional organizations, put together some guidelines for developing institutional programs to enhance antimicrobial stewardship. And so I've been the medical director of our stewardship program at uh, the OSU Medical Center for uh, the last five years or so we've, we, since we've launched the program. And we've, fortunately, the, our medical center has been very supportive and have given us um, great resources so that we have in addition to, um, we have three infectious disease physicians, we have three infectious disease specially trained pharmacists, we have a data analyst, we have some microbiology support to allow us to implement this program. And this article looks at what are the evidence-based practices, and these are things that I think could easily be also applied in the veterinary um, hospital or healthcare setting. So the the active strategies are what's called prospective audit with intervention and feedback, and then also formulary restriction, and I'll explain these a little bit more. But there's also these other supplemental strategies, education, guidelines, antibiotic ordering forms, programs to de-escalate therapy and optimize dose, and, and um, trying to switch from intravenous or parenteral drugs to oral drugs. Another way of looking at this, and the way we kind of look at this, is the front-end, back-end uh, prescribing. So the front-end is really what happens at the point of prescribing when a, a clinician is making a decision to start an antibiotic. And the most effective program has been formulary, formulary restriction and preauthorization. So we have a restricted formulary. We have a pager that um, if you want to order certain antibiotics, you have to call to get approval to use those drugs. And then um, we also, with our electronic health records, are trying to provide to providers this interactive decision support. So when a physician's trying to make a decision about whether to use an antibiotic, which one to use, there's, there's interactive decision support that helps guide them. And I think also with smartphones and apps, 
you know, there's there's guides you can get on your phones. You know, there, our residents run around with their i i pads and everything. I tell them, you know, when I was a resident, they gave us an abacus. You know, <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's how much things have changed. You know, we had our pockets loaded with books because we didn't have anything electronic. But there are all those interactive decision supports. And then on the back end, uh, this is what our pharmacists do mostly is we get lists of patients that are on different antibiotics. We have targeted antibiotics. And so those are reviewed and if we have criteria for their use and if a patient's not, um, the, the antibiotics being used for a reason that's not on one of our criteria, we give them a phone call and we try to change get them to change their, the antibiotic to a more appropriate drug. And there's also a number of other um, interventions. But I just wanted to introduce you that this is really, at the ground level, what we're dealing with to try to manage uh, the use because the drugs aren't restricted to any particular group of physicians. Any physician in the hospital can order. Um, the, and as I said, you know, there's less um, restriction around um, off-label FDA use. So this is just one, from back to the use, um, the measurement, I just wanted to share this with you. And, um, we developed an antimicrobial data mart where we can actually calculate days of therapy of all the antibiotics that are used in the medical center. And this is just one example of how this use data can, uh, can be looked at. So we implemented a formulary restriction for a carbapenem that was being added to the formulary doripenem. And that was replacing uh, imipenem, which before was on a feedback auditing mechanism where we'd review it after it was prescribed. And you can see just, and this has continued, that our carbapenem, broad spectrum carbapenem use went from around 25 antimicrobial days per thousand patient days down to cut in half to about 12. And again, this is just, I want to use this as an example of how having these metric systems in place um, can help you uh, track the, the success of some of your, your interventions and also be able to use this data to link to um, looking at resistance and the role of the antibiotic use in, in the pressure for development of resistance. So I'm, I was hoping that maybe um, something that will come out in some of the future discussions will be what um, mechanisms are actually in place right now to measure in the veterinary arena the actual antimicrobial use, the, the tonnage of antibiotics, if you will.